Good morning and welcome to To The Point. In Lansing, the state legislature is wrapping up a two-week break. On Tuesday, they'll come back into session and there's plenty to be done. The question is just how much can you get done in an election year? After all, every member in the House and every seat in the Senate up for a vote. So there will be a lot of lawmakers with their eye on November of 2018. But first, it's April 2018 and we talk with the leader of the Democrats in the Senate about what he would like to see done in the next quarter. Senator, first quarter's out of the way, second quarter about to begin in an election year very often. That's the quarter when everything that's going to get done gets done because after June, heading towards July, everybody that's running for office wants to get on the campaign trail. Sure. And that means that even those who are not running for office don't have enough folks to get anything done around here. So th this is kind of the busy time, right? Do this yeah, up? it's make or break time. You know, if we're going to get things done, uh, especially important things, it'll be this quarter. I mean, it, it shouldn't be that way, but it is. I mean, it's just, and that's not, no matter who's in power, that's what happens. So one of the things that you were commenting on before the break was the governor signing a supplemental bill that we knew he was going to sign. It's sure. $175 million pulling money ahead to put into roads for this fiscal year. Everybody says we need more money for the roads, so you can't, n nobody minds that there is more money, but you pointed out that it was not a significant amount by the time it's broken down in all the places it's coming. Yeah, when you use the formula that we use to give money to local governments and counties and the state, uh, by the time it's done, it's it really is hardly anything. You know, and I think it's, it's more of an election year gimmick than anything else. Of course, we voted for it, right? Because we all we've been saying from the beginning, uh, you know, since I've been leader and before, I've been pushing for a serious, comprehensive roads plan, and unfortunately, we didn't we didn't accomplish that. Um, you know, when I last last term, uh, uh, last session, excuse me, <coughs> it wasn't last term. It was last term for the House, but not for me. Uh, the quadrant leaders and the governor, we had a deal. We walked out of the room. We had a deal for a real plan to do 1.2 billion in new revenue. Uh, for for our roads, which is what we need at least to get it to get them back to a, a position of not being so terrible like they are now. And before we got back to even time to, to, to pitch it to our caucuses, the former Speaker Cotter pulled the rug out from the deal, and it fell apart. And then the Republicans chose to go together and do it just just Republicans, and that's exactly what they wanted to do. And now they have to own it. And I think unfortunately, you go anywhere in this state, you know, in, in your entire viewership in my area. The roads are the roads are crumbling. The bridges are are in terrible condition, and uh, you know we, we need to do something. And leadership isn't isn't blaming the federal government like the governor did, or blaming the problem. It's been around for a long time. When when I ran for office, I didn't say, well, I'm only going to fix problems that I want to fix. If someone left a problem on my my, my table, I got to fix it. And that's what a leader does. And unfortunately, the governor's been trying to blame folks and do gimmicks. And I think we need to solve this problem. I have avoided getting too far into the weeds on this for a few weeks now because it's something that I have long wondered. One of your colleagues, Senator Knizik, mentioned it uh, on one of our shows a few weeks ago and it came up again. So I'm going to go through this a little bit with you. Yeah. And you talked about the formula. Yeah. PA 51. It's the act from 1951. 51. Yeah. So it hasn't been changed in a very long time and that is the public act that shows how all money that's going to put in the transportation budget is going to be distributed. Yeah. And some people were surprised to find out during that vote back in 2015 that some of that money goes into mass transit. Mm -hmm. It gets distributed between county, townships, municipalities, and the state yep. with the bulk of it going there. But he suggested, Senator Knesik being the he, suggested that maybe that formula needs to be looked at. Is that something that you would be open to? Oh, no question about it. I mean, basically we, you know, you mentioned all the formula that gets done by MDOT, get about 40%, uh, roads and uh, county, county, um, county road commissions, uh, and then the cities, it's sort of broken down that way. And <clears throat> it's not, not equal, but you know, some, some form of that in that way. And then also it's based on lane miles. So if you have a place that, if you have to go from, you know, uh, somewhere long distances, and there's not a lot of people in those, in, in between them, you actually get more money than places like where you live, in your viewership, or in my community, or in Southeast Michigan. So where, there's, where, where the majority of the jobs are at and the majority of the people live, we actually get shortchanged on, uh, on, the, on the dollars that should be coming to our community. So I think that's it's a very fair thing to look at. I've supported bills in the past. I've actually have a, a bill drawn up that I may either introduce myself or give to one of my colleagues. Uh, and I think my colleagues in the House and Senate should support it. Basically, the, the, the vast majority of the road money goes where people live and work, right? Where the most damage is done to the roads. I don't want to, like, I, I, the, problem with it, the problem with it is I support the idea. I mean, I'm, I'm, I've supported it in the past. I support it now. 
but we are basically saying, well, we're going to take money from you to give it to us. When the real problem is we just don't have enough money in, in the overall infrastructure budget to fix the problem. And I think the viewers and your, the, the viewers and, and they're watching here, they're more than willing to pay. And they're more than willing to pay for more if they actually think the roads are going to get fixed. What people are tired of is them paying more money, them paying more money in registration, them paying more money in taxes, and seeing other people pay less, or the money not spent in a proper way. I think that's something that has to come to an end, right? I think we've, we've allowed for the people that, you, that, that you're, they're watching to pay more and more and more, and feel like they're getting less and less and less. And many people uh, all across this state and you know, across the country feel that you know, they're one terrible thing happening, a car breaking down from, from having their whole life fall, fall out from, from underneath them. That's just not acceptable. That's just not, it's just not something that we can sustain. So we have to start making sure that we stop putting everything on the backs of people that work so hard every day. And we have to make sure that we have an equitable system that makes sure that businesses and corporations pay as much as individuals do and that we pay the, the amount we need to fix the roads. Because if, you if you're driving on these roads, your axles are being damaged, your tires are being blown out, that's just not, it's not sustainable. And it really, there are certain things, you know, you can, you can argue about you know, what the, how much, what government's role is, but I think everybody, no matter where you're at the spectrum, thinks that roads and bridges should be a number, a number one or number two priority for everybody, no matter what your political spectrum, where you are on the spectrum. And there is very little disagreement that more needs to be spent for infrastructure in general. I want to get deeper into that because you sure. have an, uh, an intimate knowledge of what happens when infrastructure is neglected. Sure do. So talking of roads, speaking of the people who you think need to pay, do we have a feel for how much more and where? Are you talking about businesses, corporations? You're talking about those folks rather than a more generalized tax increase well, or, or revenue stream? I think the best way to do it is a user fee, right? Based on, you know, if, if you're using the roads, the more you use it, the more you pay. I think that's logical. I think it makes sense. But I think one of the problems we've seen is that, you know, we're trying to use general fund dollars to supplement it. And so much of our general fund is now going out through the MBT, the, the tax credits that we've given to, to, to corporations over the years where we're paying a lot of money out and less money is coming in. So more of the burden is now on the individual. When I got elected, it was about 50% individual, 50% corporations. That number is skyrocketed for individuals where corporations are now actually paying less than they're getting out. Not, not the exact, you know, not every corporation isn't getting some money in and getting out, but you know, overall, we're seeing individuals paying much more of a burden and it's just not sustainable long term. We have to have a structure, a tax structure in place that equitably makes sure that everyone pays their fair share. And I think we haven't done that. When we talk about infrastructure, there is at least one report that the governor had commissioned that says we need another $4 billion. And uh, I had someone tell me, someone who I think is pretty credible not long ago, it was $4 billion when the study was done. And every month that goes by, that number gets bigger and bigger because we're not doing the things the $4 billion might have done. So maybe it's $5 billion, whatever that That's a huge number. Is. And that really starts to deal with not just what you see, but what you don't see. We've talked about it before. Uh, I, I know that uh, Al Pasholka, uh, when he was doing a probes over in the House, said it's not sexy to talk about sewers and underground pipes and all that stuff, but it sure is a mess when it doesn't work. Yes. There's no question about it. I mean, I think if you look at the underground infrastructure, it's probably even a bigger problem than our roads. You see how bad the roads are. You're not seeing how bad your sewer systems are, your water systems, until you live in a, until you live in a community like mine, right? And people all over the world now have seen what happens when you know terrible decisions were made. No question about it. the emergency manager made a terrible decision to switch to a water source and didn't didn't do the right treatment. But the the problem, you know, the underlying problem is that we have lead pipes. Uh, and I was protected before, and they made a bad decision that exposed us a lot quicker than everybody else. But that day is coming for everyone if we don't replace those lines. And that's just that's just lead pipes. That's not counting pipes that are in that may not be lead that are in bad shape that need to be replaced. So we need to have a comprehensive program in place that Michigan needs to do our part and the federal government needs to do theirs. And in, in a comprehensive way, we need to fix the infrastructure all across this country. And doing so, we'd be providing really high-paying, good quality jobs for people that live in the communities that are that are seeing those infrastructure being put uh, that are being repaired. So we have to do that. Uh, long term, short term, we need, we need to have a serious plan to fix the roads. So when it comes to infrastructure, getting things fixed, there's a big price tag, but there's also a big budget. The problem is that budget isn't as flexible as you might think. We'll hear what Senator Ananick has to say about that and value for taxpayers too. 
next to the point welcome back to to the point the amount of money that is disposable for the state of michigan is considerable however much of that money is spoken for before it ever arrives in the coffers we continue our conversation this morning with senator jim ananick one of the problems that exist is that people say well you've got a 56 billion dollar budget you ought to be able to find four billion dollars but you're looking for four billion dollars in a pool of about 10 billion dollars yeah which is really the general fund general purpose which is what you have discretion over the rest of it is pretty much uh, much of it is federal pass -through, right? no question about it or it's fees for services that have to be used for a certain uh, function right so yeah i mean it's it's you know we spend lots of money and huge amounts of dollars that um, to, to, to every, everyday citizens, it's a lot of money. There's no question about it. And I think we have to remember that, that this is hard, hard earned money from people all across the state and we need to make sure we use it wisely. And I think one of the things that's important to note too, and I, I think if you look at how much money has been wasted this last seven years, and I'm not, and, and I'm from Flint, I fought for every dollar that, that's come to my community and I'll keep fighting to make sure we get full justice, but that never should have happened, right? We spent half a million dollars, excuse me, half a billion dollars in Flint uh, between state and federal dollars that because folks didn't use corrosion control, $100 a day, you know, we're, we're, we're spending, we're going to spend tens of millions of dollars on unemployment insurance because they, they told people they committed fraud when they didn't, they lost their homes, they lost, they went to bankruptcy. You know, we saw people in, in your community, uh, veterans being abused. We saw issues within the corrections department. You know, <clears throat> over and over and over again, I bet you we've seen a billion dollars of waste over the last seven years because for whatever reason, they don't believe that the, the people that work hard and send their money to Lance and that it has to be watched and it has to be precious and it has to be treated with respect. Uh, unfortunately, that's just been the legacy. It's been a legacy of scandal after scandal after scandal. And um, un unfortunately, we've really seen a, a, an economic boom over the last seven years, really all across the country. And in Michigan, it's been a wasted decade because we had an opportunity to make sure that everyone's everyone rose up uh, and it just didn't happen and you know now we have crumbling roads and bridges now we have a school system all across the state that's getting worse not getting better uh, we feel that you know many people feel that on monday when they go to work by friday when they get their paycheck it, they actually feel worse off than when they started the week um, you know i know a lot of the republicans have been talking about this comeback and you know everything's great and i just don't feel like people feel that across the state i mean it's better and people feel optimistic but they still don't feel secure and I think we have a lot more we can do, and we have a responsibility to do, uh, you know, in the coming quarter and next term. Because I think we have to do better for people. I lived uh, for the last decade and a half in Kent County, but near the community of Greenville. And it was a microcosm of what happened when, like in your hometown, a very big corporation pulled out, left a lot of people who were used to really good jobs, in a lurch and yeah. there were no jobs to backfill. Same thing happened in Greenville uh, when Electrolux left on a smaller scale. Sure. Taking towns like that, understanding that they have started to recover and rebound to some degree, but you still haven't made up for no. those big gaps and it's gonna be very hard to do that. So how do we go about getting the average wage <clears throat> up even as more jobs are created and, and, and try to get people to feel secure again because they've seen it happen before and they're afraid it's going to happen again. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, before I came to Lansing, you know, I was a teacher, but I also worked uh, at an after school program helping kids find jobs. And so, you know, my entire professional life, uh, whether it's helping a friend try to find a job or, you know, in this, that case, helping kids or in this capacity, working on sort of the overall economic climate for the state, I think we need, all need to do a better job of making sure that we're empowering people to get the best best out of their life that they can get. And what I mean by that is, you know, we have a child care system that has a lot of a lot of gaps. So a lot of folks don't feel like they can safely leave their kid uh, in a in a in a in a either in a home setting or in a school setting that they can either afford or is is safe for their kid. I think one we have to close those gaps and make sure that if you work for a living or trying to work for a living that you ha you can safely feel that you're dropping your kid off in a place that they're going to be safe, they're going to be nurtured, they're going to be loved. Uh, I think another thing we have to worry about is the transportation system. Many people in my community, we have a very good mass transit authority. We have a great bus system where we actually now transport more people out of our county to different jobs all across the mid-Michigan area than we do inside the actual county. So we've been creative in a way that we take people in Flint that, want, that need jobs that are unemployed to places like Howell, places in Saginaw, 
into jobs so they can have a good living. So I think we need to be creative. We need to make sure that we use the resources that we have at the federal level, work with foundations and use our state dollars in a real uh, comprehensive way that helps empower people to, 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 to make the next step in life. And that may mean a better job training program. That may mean uh, making sure the college is affordable, both at the community college and the university level, because you know I worked on getting the promise zone for my community, which I'm proud of. Uh, but we have to make sure that when, when people graduate that they're ready for college or, or for a certificate program or university and that it's affordable and then it's something that, that gets them into a job that they can have a good living. So I think that's some of the things we can do. But at the same time, we also have to demand more. You know, some of these corporations that have asked for, you know, millions if not billions in mega tax credits and these other packages, some of which I voted for. I have to be honest, I'm not going to pretend like I've been pure on those issues because I haven't. But I did it because I'm, I, 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 we have to have good paying jobs for our, for our, our citizens. But they have to do their part too, right? If you're, gonna, if you're gonna get a huge tax break for corporations from the Trump tax plan, a big tax break from Snyder for the CIT changes, and in many cases these tax credits that go out to corporations, they have to pay a living wage. They have to pay a wage that can make sure that a family can sustain themselves. And I think that's something that we should be asking. And many of these companies that are getting these credits, both at the state level and federal, are shipping their jobs overseas. And that's just not something that we can we have to say that's just, that's wrong. That you know we have to have policies in place that if if you're getting service from the government, whether you're an individual or your corporation, you have to do your part. And I think that's what we can. That's what we need to be doing in the future. I'm always interested. A living wage. Yeah. What does that look like? I mean, it's obviously it's different for somebody who lives in Southeast Michigan, where property taxes can be triple what they are in Lake County, for yeah. example. So. How do? What does that look like? Yeah, that's the you know the problem with these issues is not it's not so, so not so cut and dry, right? I mean, it's easier sometimes said than done. But I think you know government has an government has an ability. To, you know, government doesn't create jobs. What government can do is empower people to get the kind of job that they want, right? So, you know, we have you know I've heard the government the governor I agree about this. There's tens of thousands of jobs out there that may take a certificate program or a little bit of training to get someone from where they're at into a really good paying job. You know, you look at Consumers Energy, DTE. A lot of other companies, they have jobs you can make eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollars a year going through an important training program, uh, but one that people could, that I think one that that people could 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 handle and succeed at, and you're going to have thousands of jobs opening in the near future because these a lot of these folks are getting near retirement. So I mean, to me, it's 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 the kind of, you know, it's hard to exactly specify exactly what that looks like because each community is different, but it's it's a community where you feel that if you work a hard, long week. That you have enough money in your pocket to, you know, to make sure you can pay for your, your your mortgage payment, you can pay for your car, you can take your family out to a dinner, not every night, but you know, on, on the weekend, and, and maybe go on a vacation. And when we were growing up, you know, I, I grew up in Flint, so you know, my, my, my family didn't work for the auto industry. Some of my family did, my dad didn't. You know, basically the kind of rule of thumb was, you know, you you, you had a place up north, you, you probably had a, you know, maybe you didn't have a new car, but you had a car every few years. Uh, you had a decent home. You, you could send your kid to either a good public school or you could maybe spend a little bit more money and send them to a private school. And then when they graduated, you could feel that, you know, you may need some loans, you may need some scholarships, but you could send your kid to college and that they would do better than you did. And I think we're starting to lose that where college is getting way out of touch. The, the, the amount of debt the kids have to take is out of reach. You know, a lot of folks, they just feel like they're just not secure. And I don't know exactly what that dollar figure is, but I think. I think as a society we can come up to a place where most people feel that uh, right now if they have one $400 expense that they can't, they don't budget for, they can be in deep trouble. That's just not something that we can sustain. We have to have a place where the majority of jobs are, are better uh, than, than jobs like that. On one hand, it seems like I'm hearing you say that you want to create the environment where those jobs exist, where the training for the jobs that already exist can be had for folks. Yes. Am I also hearing that you want the government to set some sort of a level, or do you want the government to be more involved in making sure those jobs are there and people are ready? Yeah, for I think it's more it's, it's more the first, it's more the, the former, where you're creating an environment where those good jobs can, can prosper, and then if you're if you're asking for assistance, whether you're an individual, a worker, or a company, that you're going to make sure that, that you do your part. And what I mean by that is the government can make sure that we have good quality child care programs, high quality, good access, and affordable. Uh, well, the government can make sure that you have access to getting to those jobs, whether it's through the transit system or as we move forward with technology, there may be other ways to do that as well. Uh, and then there's training programs that, that aren't going to break your bank. Some people, that they're, they're, they want to get in those jobs, they just can't afford to take that break and go to school 
you know, maybe it's, maybe it's access to more apprenticeship programs. Maybe it's uh, finding ways to be flexible with people's benefits. Because a lot of folks that we all know, we may not know they're on assistance in some form. Maybe it's a, a Medicaid program. Maybe it's a child care tax credit. Uh, but they need a little bit of help. And I think that's okay as long as it's leading them to, the, to a better life. And I think we can do more to make sure that happens. So me, it's more of a creating an environment where people can, you know, can, can, can make the next move in their life. And it's government being flexible and, and empowering as opposed to punishing. And I think that's been kind of my philosophy on it. We have my fault gotten off on a very important conversation yes. that uh, <laughs> was, no, it's really, uh, it, 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 I think it's important to have this, but I promised uh, to give you a little time to talk about what you wanted to get done in this quarter. We started that off. Is, the, is there anything or a couple other things that you would really like to see get done? Yeah, I think, you know, back to roads, I want to make sure that we go back and, and put more money. You know, we, we offered uh, some pretty substantial amendments that the that money we had, we could have afforded to make a major impact on improving the roads, I think that needs to still be looked at second quarter. I think we need to make sure that we have some policies in place to make sure things like Flint and the PFAS and, and Rockford and other communities, they get, get addressed. You know, we've, we've put resources to fixing those problems. But we've made very few, if any, real substantive uh, policy changes to make sure that public is aware when a problem like this happens and is protected if something happens. That's another one of the functions that I think everyone agrees, that if you turn on your, your water, whether you're at a well or in a municipal system, that the water coming out, that you have some really really good assurance that it's, it's decent quality water uh, and unfortunately all across the state now too many people are unsure of that so I think when it comes to policies like that I think we should pass some of the bills that I've been working on in a bipartisan way with Senator Hewn and some of the other individuals Senator Stamets and others in the house on um, giving some transparency um, and some um, better understanding and better alerts for people uh, both with, with lead but also in other quality water issues so Infrastructure, and we're not going to fix it next next quarter, but we can make a major impact on and try to make you know, a little bit better for folks. The first order of business for lawmakers when they head back to Lansing will be working on the budget, something they've already been doing for the past several weeks. As you know, in the past seven years, that budget has been done in early June. That's something the governor and lieutenant governor, when they were here on the show last week, said they want to continue. So that will be a priority. But some of the other things we talked to Senator Ananick about may come up as well. And it is an election year, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in Lansing. We'll be there to bring it to you, and we'll be back with more To The Point. Lawmakers in Lansing and Washington will head back to work this week, and there's a lot to be done on both fronts. Budget will be important in Lansing, as we've been talking about, but the same is true in Washington, D.C. Even though they signed that budget agreement, it will expire at the end of September, and they need to have something else in place. They already have the framework, but the question is, will they be able to agree upon it, or just five weeks out of an election, will there be another budget showdown? That's always a possibility. And of course, there are other things we'll be watching. Does anything happen with infrastructure either in Washington or in Lansing? That could impact us all. We'll talk about it every Sunday morning when you join us right here at 10 o'clock on Wood TV. To the point.